Hello, and welcome everyone to Quaver PLC's Leaders in Education. My name is Erica Adkins, and I am the Director of Implementation here at Quaver Ed. In this session, we will be discussing the role and impact of community schools. I'm excited to introduce you to our guest today, Dr. Janine Alassir. Dr. Janine Alassir is a clinical assistant professor in the Department for Theory and Practice in Teacher Education at the University of Tennessee, as well as the director of their University Assisted Community Schools Initiative. Dr. Alassir is a board member with the Tennessee Educators of Color Alliance and has previously served as a community school coordinator, an innovation project manager with Great Schools Partnership, and a Mosaic Changemaker Fellow with the Tennessee Educational Equity Coalition. Welcome, Dr. Alice here. It's so great to have you with us today. Happy to be here. All right, let's jump right in. So let's start with the big picture for this discussion. What is a community school? A community school is a model. It's the idea that a school is both a place and a set of partnerships that's ensuring that not just students, but teachers, community members, community leaders, everyone in that community is able to thrive. Can you tell me about the history of community schools and how how this initiative began? So when we think about the history of community schools, we're talking about the late 1800s and Hull House with Jane Addams, um, and really thinking about the schools as not just a place for academic learning, but also to provide social services to the community. Um, When you think about a hungry child or a child whose parent is experiencing a mental health issue, um, those are, that's not a child who is going to be able to learn and academically excel. And so it started back then with that model of bringing in other services that do contribute to academic growth, but are necessary foundations for that. Okay. And so talk a little bit about what your role is in this initiative. Yeah. So I oversee um, uh, an initiative of community schools, and we work with two different school districts. Um, and I help to oversee the work of the coordinators at each of those schools. And so you all have a few different um, districts that you are now partnering with. Mm -hmm. What does a community school look like, Um, especially, and maybe you have an example of one that's sort of just starting out and one that's been a community school for a while? Yeah, so when I... Uh, talk about our community school and its infancy. We are really on a data collecting mission, and we have spent the last year just focused on a needs and assets assessment, getting to know the key um, personnel and the key community members who are going to be invested in our community school strategy, and then creating a step a step-by-step plan, an action plan towards short-term and long-term goals at the school. Um, and so that is really just the, the very first steps of the community school. And we are about to kick off co- coalescing our site steering committee. And that is a group of invested uh, stakeholders in the community who will help to enact this action plan alongside the community school coordinator. On the opposite end of things, we have a community school that's in its 12th year, And that was really started as a way to interrupt our school-to-prison pipeline um, and working with students who are in juvenile justice. And so we took a really high-needs school, and we started to um, provide a lot of expanded learning time and enrichments. And um, that was sort of the bedrock of the community school because it was the highest need for the students. They needed something to do in between the 3 and 7 p.m. mark. Um, And so we have a giant puppet making. We have um, really cool arts programs. And uh, from there, we've built out into um, addressing some of those other challenges. And so now we're also targeting chronic absenteeism, really engaging families back into the community uh, and and back into the school building itself. Wow, that sounds wonderful. Mm -hmm. So I just want to ask a little bit more about that. So you you mentioned timing and short-term, long-term, and now you've just mentioned that one of your community schools has been a partner for 12 years. Mm -hmm. What does the timing look like? What What is short-term? What's considered short-term? What's considered long-term? Um, in terms of the phases maybe that you go through, what is the timing of this process? Great question. So some of it is going to be low-hanging fruit that might be able to be um, immediately started. And so that's something that you might think of when you create a community profile. What are assets in the community? Um, what are groups that want to plug in, who want to help? Um, is there a group who really wants to be engaged with the school just for like a community service day? Maybe they come in and they help to create a garden bed. Um, but you also have really long-term goals. And so that's when you're thinking about targeting your um, maybe some behavior some chronic absenteeism, social and emotional needs, that is more of a long-term goal that you're going to have to have some strategic um, uh, short-term goals that are going to lead to that long-term success. 
And so ultimately, this is something that you hope sustains for the lifetime of the school. Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. So really what your organization does is creates this model for schools to operate with that brings in this this concept of the community. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think that's really important to know. You have a model. And so we would love to see that model potentially um, mimicked in other communities or with other schools. And that's what our viewers here could maybe take away from this entire conversation is really just that model that you all have have begun and and it's been successful. Mm-hmm. Yes. Great. There's okay. also um, a tool that has been used that some colleagues and I have put together that's going to take you through this process of creating a community profile, identifying some of those key stakeholders, and then leading you towards an action plan and the creation of a site steering committee on site. And so through those processes, you can really take uh, the idea of a community school and put it into practice. And so those community schools Mm -hmm. sort of operate um, around a foundation of pillars. Is that correct? Can you tell me what those pillars are? So there are four pillars, and those are um, active family and community engagement, integrated student supports, expanded learning time and enrichment, and collaborative leadership and practices. Wow. Okay. I would love to just jump in and talk through each one of those. Mm -hmm. Um, So can you start with telling me about um, the first pillar, active family and community engagement? I love starting here because I think that this is really the foundation of a community school. Um, When you think of a schoolhouse, it's a piece of real estate that we all own. We all pay taxes. We're all engaged. And so um, working together with active and family and community engagement really thinks of the school as a hub of services. And it uh, reimagines it as a place where families can come and access anything that they might need or that their child might need. Sure. Mm Mm-hmm. So that engagement lends itself then to the next pillar, um, integrated student supports. Mm -hmm. So could you tell me a little bit more about what types of supports students and families receive? Yeah, so that's really going to depend uh, school to school, but we want to make sure that when a child is sitting in their seat in the classroom, they have everything they need to learn. That might be a paper and pencil, but it might also mean addressing a mental health need or ensuring that a family has Um, the finances to pay their electric bill, uh, making sure they have a coat so that when they go out for recess that they're able to play. It can look a lot of different ways, but we want to make sure that all the services are available right there at the school. Great. I think that a lot of our viewers may be wondering, how do you provide those types of services and supports to students and families? Do you all partner with different organizations that bring in that type of support? What does that look like? Yes, yes, to all of the above. So we're we're looking at uh, a question of access and awareness. So there might be um, things that are available through the city or the county, um, opportunities that might help to take care of those bills. Um, it might also mean that you're engaging a community partner to help pour back into the school. Um, perhaps you need mentors and you're working with a local church who might come over and mentor and tutor. Um, perhaps you're trying to fill this electricity bill, and maybe there is a a pool of a local neighborhood association that might be able to take care of that kind of need. But making sure that the community partners are aware of what the needs are and then bringing those resources into the school is at the heart of what we're talking about. Wow. That sounds like a a truly incredible support for families. Um, Wonderful. So those supports really assist students, families, in overcoming barriers. Um, and really, it sounds like provide them opportunities maybe to even learn about things that they enjoy. Um, you know, like with those after-school opportunities, maybe they find a, a lifelong passion. You know, mm-hmm. that's, so that's a really neat opportunity for them to engage in as well yeah. and maybe level the playing field, it sounds like, um, mm-hmm. for all students. Mm-hmm. So that third pillar that we that you had mentioned um, before Tell me more about that one. It was like expanding learning and opportunities. Yeah, so expanded learning time and opportunities. You can think, you know, uh, an average school is open at 8 and closes at 3, but you can think of uh, it's an opportunity either before or after school for kids to um, partake in new and different opportunities, maybe arts programming that they normally wouldn't have access to. It can also mean a really traditional, you know, tutoring program or something like that. Um, It also means engaging parents at the school, and that expanded academic time might be a GED class for parents. It might be an English language learning class for parents and students to take part in together, or perhaps a Spanish class for teachers so that they're able to learn a language and communicate better with parents. Um, It can look different in every school, and it's really going to depend on the need, but expanding those opportunities for kids to maybe find a new passion or for adults to get things that they need is at the heart of that. Great. Mm -hmm. Um, And then there's one last pillar, Mm -hmm. correct? Um, That one, collaborative leadership and practice. What does that look like? 
You want to make sure that every stakeholder in the community, that's your administrators, your teachers, your students, have a voice at their school. And so when we think about the community school needs and assets assessment, that is a way to bring in all of this data that you've collected um, to get the thoughts and opinions of all these stakeholders and coalesce them around an action plan to move forward. Um, Collaborative leadership and practices also centers on a site steering committee that occurs at the school, and that is an engaged group of uh, Uh, parents and teachers and students who are able to come together, talk about the challenges that are identified, and then create an action plan for short and long-term goals of the community school. So I I think that our viewers may be wondering, you know, this type of support is is really incredible. Many, many students, many schools really could use this type of support. Mm -hmm. So how how might a school go about... um, becoming a community school? Is that something that they can, you know, sort of take that model and run with it? Can they apply to be a community school? What does that look like? So it's really going to depend on the school and the district. However, there are certain elements of what we're talking about that can be brought into any school at any time. Um, It's always helpful to have a community school coordinator to help to lead this work, but we see a lot of these different aspects being taken over by your school counselor and social worker, the school principal, um, but really thinking about what assets do we have in the community and what community partners can we engage towards a mutually beneficial partnership? Um, Is there a local arts program that is looking to serve kids and can you connect with them so that they're able to provide an after-school class for free? Um, is there a local church who is looking for a way to engage with the school? And do you have a need for after-school tutors? Thinking about matching those needs with what the community has to offer is a really great great way to start that process. It sounds like together, these pillars and this, this whole model really could transform schools. Can you tell me a little bit about the process for starting the community school? How does how, once you've determined, okay, we're going to go partner with this school, um, and and transform them into a community school? What does that look like? So I think that making sure that the community is on board and that they are really invested in being a community school and that they're interested in that collaborative leadership and this collaborative practices is is really the first step. Um, Once you have that, of course, if you would like to have a community school coordinator, you'd have to identify funding, and that can be federal through your district, um, through a nonprofit. It's really going to vary district to district. Um, From there, you're hiring a community school coordinator, someone who knows the community very well and who is able to kind of hit the ground running to get to know parents and families and stakeholders in that community. And then, of course, you want to build that community profile and the needs and assets assessment. And that's where you're going to be doing really intentional data collection amongst the stakeholder groups to find out what it is that is the you know, highest needs in that community. Um, and moving forward from there into creating an action plan and your site steering committee who will lead that work. Great. So could you talk a little bit about maybe what the goal setting process might look like mm-hmm. and, and maybe just like um, how to get started with determining those needs? So once you know what some of those uh, assets are in the community and you know how to have uh, how to provide access to those, then you can start to match up those needs. Um, is there uh, a need for maybe behavior supports at the school? Um, do you need to incentivize that for kids? And are there community partners who are looking to provide new and different opportunities for kids? Can any of those match up? Um, Are there invested community members who are looking for um, an opportunity to plug into the school and um, really get to know kids and families better? And maybe you also have a need for mentorship. So as you start to pair up those needs with the assets, you can start to build out what are your steps in the short term and then in the long term to get towards the goals that the school has, whether academic or social, emotional or otherwise. And so when you all partner with schools, mm-hmm. you all do a lot of this work for them. You you create those partnerships. You find those resources. You bring them to the school. Mm-hmm. It's so hard <laughs> because, you know, our—, our Administrators are focused on our teachers and our teachers are focused on our students, but who is focused on the community and who is making sure that parents have new and different opportunities to plug into the school that isn't just your uh, parent-teacher conference night or something like that. And so that really helps to have that coordinator there to help identify opportunities and to bring in partners to the school. It sounds like a needs and assets assessment really helps clarify the unique aspects and needs of the community. Um, So how can we view those unique aspects maybe um, in, through the lens of diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. The community schools model itself is a DEIA initiative. 
Um, when you think about helping an individual student in a classroom, perhaps you're dealing with a behavior issue with one student. When you get them the mental health services, the behavioral services, um, and perhaps the mentor services that they need, you're not just helping that one student to succeed. You're helping every student who is surrounding them in the classroom. Likewise, when you are helping a family with a need, you're not just helping that one individual family member, but you're helping the entire school community to really bolster itself and help to move towards community change. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that. I have to imagine there are some educators with us who would love to have some of these structures in place, who would really love to utilize this model. So how can educators in schools that are not currently community schools use this information that you've shared today um, to, to really bolster their students' supports? We know how busy our teachers and our administrators are, and so I know that it can be difficult to identify the time or the monetary resources to really get this work going, but there are tools that you can use to help you become more aware and to create greater accessibility about the assets in your community. Um, so we've developed a tool, some colleagues and I, uh, that walks you through the process of a community school profile um, and then identifying your needs and assets, your challenges, and then to create an action plan that you could coalesce a site steering committee around enacting. Great. And that's something that you're willing to let us share um, through this series as well, correct? Absolutely. Great. So we'll, we'll definitely link that to the page. Perfect. We appreciate you for sharing that. Of course. Thank you so much for joining us today. I really enjoy learning from you about community schools. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us today. We hope this discussion resonated with you and that you've gained some new insights to put into practice. We look forward to continued future growth together. Thank you.